Hey all, here are OS Reviews. Today we're taking a revisited throwback look at the LG Double Play, a pretty interesting Android smartphone that came out in 2011 because it has a secondary display which can be seen after you slide out this QWERTY keyboard. It was certainly a quirky, interesting idea, however commercially the Double Play didn't fare so well, although this phone was never really meant as a flagship to begin with. However, it was around the same time that other dual screen phones were being launched for the first time, including the Curacera Echo. You guys may remember this as a precursor in a way to phablets because it really was one of the largest screens at the time using this two combined panels to make a larger elongated screen. It's actually quite similar to the ZTE Axon M that came out more recently and of course now with real folding phones the need for something like this has since diminished because there is that unsightly gap between the two panels that made interaction a little bit awkward. Versus the Double Play, which even though the system hardware internals are similar in terms of the processor and RAM, the secondary screen is a lot more limited in terms of the functionality. That being said, since we're taking a trip down memory lane anyways, other phones around the time which experimented with the idea of secondary screens included the Samsung Continuum, which was one of the first phones to come with a small ticker screen on the bottom, separated from the larger display on the top. This is an idea that was later reproduced using LG's V10, V20, and also some later HTC phones with a secondary screen on the very top that could be used to display the time and notifications without waking the entire screen. And then much more recently, there are Android devices that have secondary screens on the back. This one here from Meizu, the Pro 7, also experiments with using a second screen mainly for notifications, whereas other ones are more practical, like the Yoda phone has a secondary screen that's more of an e-ink panel versus a color screen on the front designed for watching videos and doing media tasks. So through the years, manufacturers have come out with their different interpretations of what a secondary screen should be, but arguably out of the bunch, LG's interpretation is the weirdest and perhaps the least practical. Coming back to the device here, on the front we do have a primary 3.5 inch display, which although small by today's standards for 2011 was about average in terms of screen size. It's a capacitive IPS panel which offers decent viewing angles, and then down below there are touch sensitive keys which are backlit to navigate the typical Android functions. Omitted from the hardware would be a front facing camera. This device didn't have it, so no selfies or video conferencing unfortunately, and in terms of specs they were decent for the time, including a Snapdragon 1 GHz processor along with half a gig of RAM. Now, the phone is made entirely out of plastic, so this was before the days where making phones out of aluminum or glass was really the norm, even for mid-end phones, so the device doesn't feel the most premium, however, it's surprisingly hefty because of that sliding keyboard and secondary screen. In fact, it's about the same as the Curacera Echo in weight. Otherwise, on the top, there's a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, a power key, the side here features a micro USB port for charging, and that is pretty much it. The phone does support SD card behind the back cover if you wanted to expand on the built-in memory. So returning now to the main interface, LG did have a customization on top of Android 2.3 Gingerbread. Back in the day, it was dubbed as the S-Class interface. It does have very colorful icons and whatnot, but at the time it was acceptable, and especially towards a younger, more messaging-centric crowd that the phone was being targeted at, Anyways, there's still remnants which are familiar in terms of the UI. You can swipe down to access some quick shortcuts to things like Wi-Fi, GPS, Bluetooth. We can also pinch out to take a look at all of our screens. There are seven which we can customize with different application shortcuts and widgets per our liking. And then down below here is our universal app tray. Now this phone did come with T-Mobile service here in the United States. So there's quite a bit of bloatware going on from various trial versions of games, the swipe keyboard, telenav for GPS services, and now switching to that secondary screen and taking a closer look, which really is the whole point of this device. Again, it measures two inches diagonally. And one of the downsides though, is it definitely makes the QWERTY keyboard a bit more cramped than usual since it takes up that extra space. All in all though, the keys themselves are still usable and it just takes a bit of time to get used to and acclimated to the split layout. 
Now, as aforementioned, there's eight applications that you can use the secondary display for. You're limited to just eight that you can see. Uh, you can long hold if you want to delete certain functions and bring in other ones. So for example, if I want to delete group chat, I can add another one uh, that can be social plus, which is kind of social media aggregation. But in total, you only have these nine possibilities to pick from. So there's no way to add or install any additional apps that can take advantage of the second screen since it's been so heavily custom Optimized, has pretty similar resolution to the main screen and on such a small little uh, size the actual PPI is higher than the main display which is a little ironic and funny but it is a pretty sharp uh, screen as a result. So if we take a closer look at some of these uh, for example rich note what this allows you to do is take a quick look at some kind of memos and notes that you may have taken using the phone so for example if you want to tap on a specific note here um, you can see that you're able to quickly read it out and still use the top screen for something like web browsing, and you're still able to make those changes without too many issues. Now, if you tap on the top arrow key, what that does is it pushes this app onto the top screen, which is kind of neat. So if you tap on it, it basically extends it onto this larger view with a more traditional layout. So if we tap to go back home, additional controls that we have here, uh, things like messaging also allows us to see any group messages that we have. Um, you can see conversations and you can kind of reply directly to them just using this keyboard and this smaller screen underneath. Music allows you to play back uh, a track. You can also shuffle, find additional music and kind of use it like a MP3 player control pad, which is neat. But again, you do have to slide open the keyboard to access the secondary display. For things like photos, what it does is it gives you a quick view of some of the images that you have displayed on it, but you can't actually full screen it onto this small section. Whenever you tap on an image, it just allows you to share it using a service. Now in terms of browser, it's also not taking you into the full web browser, but rather showing as a second screen for various bookmarks. In some cases, as you interact with various pages, it also changes the layout to some of the icons, additional settings and controls, which you can do depending on the app. So it becomes basically an interactive section uh, for additional controls. And out of the options, really the two most useful ones would be the browser app and probably the calendar app, which can tell you if there's any new notifications which are coming along. And uh, if you constantly sync your agenda and have different uh, uh, appointments saved onto your phone, it could be still quite neat as you see different alerts being displayed down below here. Aside from that, the Double Play definitely wasn't really an extraordinary phone in other areas. Things like the camera and performance were decent, but uh, also not uh, really anything noteworthy. A pretty primitive looking interface. It does have tap to focus, it does have autofocus, it's a 5 megapixel sensor, uh, but again, not really anything that we haven't seen before, especially in 2020, but uh, you do have some additional controls and settings over there. The 1 gigahertz processor though does sometimes need a bit of time for images to be snapped into focus when you are scrolling quickly. After a second of hesitation, it then kind of fully uh, becomes extended as you're able to do some kind of emails, text messages, and even some word editing, some productivity. If you download kind of Polaris Office, there's a trial version which is included out of the box, things like social media with that keyboard. But more than anything, it was just an interesting look back at a moment when Android was still relatively new to the market and manufacturers were doing pretty wild experimental things with their form factors. And LG had one of the more unique, I think, approaches on a secondary display. These days, LG does still make dual screen phones, but now it's using a second kind of accessory that you snap onto their devices like the V60 line. And the concept is actually really similar to the Kyocera Echo, the ZTE Axon M, and having two screens stuck together, but still having a bit of a gap in between them. However, it's definitely more useful, I think, than in this case, unless you are someone that has to have a physical keyboard. You can check out more details in the links down below for now that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. It's just been a pretty quick retrospective on the dual-screened LG Double Play.